Welcome to module three. Let's talk keywords, tags, and descriptions. We talk about keywords as the backbone of SEO for good reason, and we're going to dive into this as ranking factors number six and seven. So keywords, yeah, they hold the key. It goes without saying that the words we're using throughout our site are, you know, really important for a number of reasons. And instead of just calling them words, website words, we call them keywords. And the keywords specifically are the ones that matter and that are important. And they're not the kind of connector sauce. They're the actual meat and potatoes of our website and our offering. So the first thing that we want to do, of course, is the research. What are people using in our, their search queries when they do find us or try to find us or could potentially find us, our services, our products, our offering. And then how do we map those into our website in a strategic way? So we want to be able to spend some time on this and it's not hard. It actually can be really fun when you see the language of your customers that's different probably from yours as the internal operator. And then how do we, yeah, use them in a way that is going to benefit us. So we don't want to just throw keywords on a page for the reasons we've talked about. It's kind of shady sometimes, but more than that, it it also just reads like nonsense and jargon. And uh, that's not the idea. You want people to stick around and get a lot out of your content more than just the search index. And if the index or the web crawler is getting all sorts of keywords from your website, great. That's going to drive people there. But remember that when they get there, if it's nonsense, you're not going to have done your job. They're not going to convert into a customer. So we want to guide web crawlers and search engines to our site, but not at the cost of usability for, uh, for our users and our, and our traffic. So we want to create value at every stage. And we talk about this all the time on our social content, but it also applies to every single piece of our website, every section, every page, every call to action, clean, tight, concise. I can't say this enough. And this is where most websites fall short. They're confusing. They're overwhelming. They're saying way too much. And the user does not need that information. This is where oftentimes in our website classes, we say to people, you've got to go away and pair that back by 140 pages before you bring back the 20 that you want to keep and stop being married to every piece of it. Pull out those 400 old blog posts and put them into an investor report or some kind of offsite, whatever, volume. And it's okay to have them as blog posts. I'm more referring to the pages throughout your site that can be like tertiary and secondary and all sorts of, you know, drop down menus, etc., that are unnecessary and not what your customer wants in modern day short attention span times where they just want to get to their finish line quickly. This applies whether you're buying a car, by the way, or a t-shirt. We don't want to wrestle through click after click after click after click to get to the finish line. So how do we know what tags and page titles, keywords in general to use on our site? The easiest place to go is Google Analytics. We're going to head into our acquisition section, which is how people find us. How did we acquire that traffic? And then we're going to go into organic search. And right there, it's going to tell us the words people are using when they found us and our website. And some of them are hilarious, like spaghetti sauce on social school site, or they're just what you would think they would be. Instagram course, LinkedIn class. However, Google Analytics has to shim a lot of that information for privacy reasons. It's something to do with a lawsuit several years ago. So there are third party tools that can actually tell us a lot more. You're going to see in your Google Analytics and organic search section that possibly as much as 80 to 90% of the queries are kind of blanketed into a bucket that you can't see. So that's where we turn to a few others. Um, a quick note here. So when we do look at our analytics, we're going to get a lot of information. I don't want to ever turn you off Google analytics because it is literally one of the most important pieces of the puzzle and beyond just acquisition, we've got so much information about behavior. So what people are doing on our site, page by page, the user flow, the journey they take, the bounce rate, the dwell time. And then also, of course, all the kind of Um, audience factors like who they are, where they're coming from, how often they're returning, tablet versus mobile versus desktop, new versus returning. I said that already. Um, Gender, demographics, everything. It's gold. It is so much more than just traffic and, you know, overall page views. We need to go deeper into this and better understand what people are doing with our site and really see how organic versus paid or whatever other traffic is changing over time. The source information is so important. 
That's my rant about Google Analytics. Don't discount it. Um, and again, seeing this page here. So what are those channels that people are driving from? Is it direct? So they're typing in your URL directly because they happen to know it or they're being led there directly um, through maybe your e-newsletter or something. Uh, organic search, they find you so naturally. That's the, the piece of the pie we want to grow, grow, grow. And then, of course, social, referral, email, other, paid, etc. So a couple of other really great third-party tools that I want to show you are Moz. Moz.com is like nothing but SEO help. There's paid tools, there's free tools. I really encourage you to check it out. Their keyword explorer is very fun. You may have to create a free account with your login, so they're gonna capture your email address, but that doesn't mean that you have to even start a free trial or a paid trial. Um, you can go into their free SEO tools, as you see in the top right corner there, and do the keyword explorer. You can do it by region, um, closer like city or locality, and you can see what types of keywords people are using when they find your website. Pop in your website, pop in your competitor's website, see what people are searching and how they find you. Super cool. This is literally keyword mapping here to say, holy smokes, I sell auto mechanic services but people are using, you know, the dumbest terminology when they find my auto body shop because they have no idea what the proper terminology is because we're not mechanics, most of us. And thus, I need to find a way to use their language, not mine. It's not about impressing my car buddies with all of my industry terms and jargon. It's about capturing my actual dummy public. Pardon me. Um, so again, head on into Moz. You're going to see lots of stuff there if you're interested. And uh, again, so much free stuff here that is going to give you some tools. Another one that is my absolute favorite when it comes to content generation and the actual blog titles you can use when creating that super rich, linkable, searchable content um, that can go viral if you really do your job is answerthepublic.com. Same kind of thing, you might have to create a free account. They usually let you do sort of one free search and then you have to create an account. But the idea is that you're gonna enter your industry, your realm, your field, your expertise. I wrote in dog trainer. And from there, I get the when, where's, which, wills. So will dog training help separation anxiety? Hmm, if that's a well-trafficked query, I might be very, very smart to create a blog post that says how dog training helps separation anxiety and then run from there. And remember, write it like a journalist where you don't bury the lead and the good stuff. You pop it right at the top and you get them wanting more, wanting more. You're throwing in additional sources and information, but you're not hiding it. You're getting to the point in your title and your subheader and your opening paragraph and you're employing the best writing you possibly can. If you're not a writer, that's okay. Just get down your thoughts in a 10 tips or how to or did you know. We can't shy away from content creation. It is so important for SEO. So answer the public is another really good one. But what matters here is that we're just giving search engines and of course our users, which are our customers and prospects, the info that they're looking for. That is why we're searching, you and I. We're looking for answers. So we need to, as businesses, answer those queries and solve those problems and serve those people to show them that in fact we're exactly what they need and they should also love us and trust us and come back for more because we're really human and authentic and we're right here waiting. We're ready. We are your solution. We are the weight off your shoulders, your hallelujah moment. We are exactly what you're looking for. Look no further. And in order to be seen, we're of course properly titling, tagging, and categorizing those pages, blog posts, and images. So if we want our site as a whole, and of course the individual pages within it, don't discount that you can have an individual page SEO strategy just by adjusting that page description in the back end of the page. Um, we've got to we've got to use that copy, of course, um, in that or use those words in that copy. So both in the stuff people see on the front end and the stuff I mentioned that they don't in the back end. Let's clarify what head keywords and long tail keywords are. So a head keyword is just short and sweet, very broad, very basic, top of funnel search. And what it comes with is a high cost and a high competition. High cost if you're bidding on it for ads. You're bidding on the word shoes, good luck. You're gonna spend probably $40 a click. But if you're gonna bid on or create content around 
Nike red men's running shoes won't cost you so much, won't be as much competition, and hopefully you'll rank for that search term. But you need people to more directly search with the words red Nike men's running shoes versus shoes. So there's pros and cons to both. But the idea is that if your long tail keywords can rank and you can, you can nail them, like hit them on the head, you're going to have a higher probability of conversion with them too, because it's a more filtered direct search. An example, fashion. When I put fashion in, again, the informational results, uh, SERP page is very clear here. So all sorts of realms, but good on Fashion Nova and Fashion Magazine and Calgary Fashion um, as a page on Avenue Calgary Magazine is showing up right at the top. And then a Wikipedia result and some top story news results. So excellent SEO organically for the top that are ranking on that head keyword without a paid ad behind it. Long tail keywords, Men suits Calgary. Wow, that's a direct search, Kelly. Okay, we're gonna show you a map. We're gonna show you some reviews, some actual storefronts. Still not too many ads, but it could just be that people aren't placing ads for men suits Calgary at this time in this market, and you know they're showing up organically instead. If one of them, however, <laughs> or uh, someone who's ranking on page two or spot two hundred places a paid ad, amazing, great opportunity to show up. And this is where I would encourage you to take note of the paid search results you're seeing in your field as well. Who's doing them? Who's not? Who's maybe gaming it a little bit? I've done searches before for education institutions and seeing that, you know, I type in Mount Royal University and U of C might show up. Well, of course, again, they're bidding on each other's keywords and they'd be smart to do so because that's a lot of traffic that they can steal. Some companies I've been told have been, you know, created moratoriums, Pepsi versus Coke. There's no point in outbidding each other or or bidding on each other's keywords because you're just going to drive up the cost of everybody's business. So anyway, just take note of who's bidding. I've also done a a search before for a juice company, direct search, and received a search ranking from a different one that said, try our juice, it's better. (laughs) So it's a, it's a interesting market and game, but bottom line, we want to show up even if we have to pay for it for a little while till our organic search uh, comes to fruition. Finally, my favorite keyword planning tool and just overall research tool is Google Keyword Planner. So you can Google that, Google Keyword Planner, and you'll be driven to basically the Google Ads interface. And you, again, are going to go down the garden path, maybe create a little account for yourself. In fact, you have to if you don't already have one. You do not have to place an ad. But this is the best tool on the internet to tell you keywords and to map out the ones you want to use based on those like high ranking and highly search queried and expensive terminologies versus those ones that are a little bit off the beaten path, the side road that you can capture people with. And, um, and it's a little bit less competitive. So you don't have to actually go through with placing those ads, but Google keyword planner is going to allow you to create a campaign almost like building your keywords, thinking about where you would use them, writing the little description that would go under that title of the ad and really getting kind of a map that you can export and then implement into your website or your content channels. So I encourage you to play with that. You're going to get so much information. And it's really interesting too to see the cost if you were to place Google ads because that means you know, you're seeing how much it costs to bid on these very popular or unpopular keywords. So I can see that to utilize the words Instagram marketing course in September, October, and maybe August is extremely expensive in Toronto, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Calgary. But that's a great time for me then to hit up Saskatoon, Regina, you know, Ottawa, um, or elsewhere. And, uh, and likewise, when it is that I can, um, or when I do need to find a keyword that is a kind of high priced and what I'm going to bid on it and why and, and for how long, etc. Just kind of an interesting way to start to see how your paid ads would, would play out. Finally, tags, titles, and descriptions. So this is essentially the <clears throat> part of the HTML programming language. So remember, if you were to see the back end of a website, you're going to see a lot of just text, code, ones and zeros, essentially. It's not the beautiful front end um, image based website that we see when it's published. But this is how we add functionality formatting to our sites and how crawlers read our website because they don't have eyeballs, they have crawlers. 
So um, search engines use HTML almost exclusively, and a major component of this SEO strategy of ours is to have an organized HTML map set up for our pages. We don't have to be a coding expert to understand how this helps and how it works. It is uh, kind of just baked into the natural website building process. So they call it a title tag, but really it's the title, the page title, about, home, products, contact, the most basic kind of sitemap. But um, here we can see that, um, and it's the most important thing for search engines to use. They know that that is your social school website about page. Great. If someone Googles about social school, that's where they're headed. It's fairly obvious if I've titled my pages accordingly. We want to keep it non-spammy. We want to keep it clear for those reasons. Don't call yourself something funky when really it's your about page or your products. And then what we can see here that the city of Calgary has done on this particular website page about public skating is they have put a dash in between. So their page title, not that what's going to be seen in the, in the navigation, but on the back end, they've altered their title of their page to be the city of Calgary dash public skating and shinny hockey schedule. Amazing. Lots of description in there. So they've got keywords going into it. The, the, the actual kind of page description comes next, but that's the gray text below. They've maybe altered or adjusted the slug or the page extension there in the URL to be more clear so that it doesn't have a whole like 40 words in it and dates and numbers. It's just like public skating schedule, whatever it is that can help too. Let's look at how this appears on a, another page about hockey skates. So the title tag is there, 10 Best Senior Ice Hockey Skates 2018 Review from Honest Hockey Website. And then the meta description is, you know, a whole lot of uh, short form or shortcuts to what they're saying on that page to get me to click in and want more, but they're showing us price, they're showing us models, they're using a lot of keywords in there too, which is cool. And then the next thing we're going to look at is header tags. And that is where the actual H1s, H2s, H3s. So you think about your, your header font one, header font two, and header font three on that page, which comes below usually the title of the page, is next being pulled in. So the header tag in this case is pulling that here are the best hockey skates to buy in 2018. That's probably an H1. And then all those bullet points below, probably written in H2 or H3. So that's how, and then you have an image tag there on the right side where those skates either are pulled from that same page or tagged accordingly as, you know, the same type of description. Uh, when we go back to our oven page, we see the same thing in play here. So Best Buy in that top ranking search result has labeled that page ranges, cooktops, and ovens, at least in their back end. They've, they've labeled it that. On their page, it might just say ranges or cooking. Um, or in their navigation, I should say. And then you see their meta description in gray, and then you get a few additional kind of tag words just below that, um, that, that again, Google's pulling in and um, they're keeping it quite simple. So nice and clean. So we wanna give each page a unique title tag. That's important because remember, that's part of our individual page SEO strategy. We wanna make sure that the important keyword appears at the front or the start if we can. So City of Calgary didn't really do that, but they still had it pretty close or it was pretty uh, self-explanatory. Include the branding. That was where the City of Calgary or Best Buy included their company name, the branding in the title of the page. Again, not in the main nav public title, but in the back end title which I'll show you in a second. So Google puts the most weight on the first keyword and the least on the last. Don't bury your keyword in that title. Keep them to under 65 to 75 characters in length. Capitalize the start of each word so it looks like a title. Um, sample formats there you can see. Product brand, product description, line, your company, or dash. The service you offer, your company. Teen counseling, Mayfair counselors. Um, maybe you have a city in there as well, which again, if you're very heavily localized, smart thing to do because I'm Googling teen counseling Calgary. And if that's appearing in your page, I'm headed straight to your page, not even your homepage. I, you've optimized that individual teen counseling page for me to find first and foremost. So I don't have to land on your homepage and then cross my fingers that I can find teen counseling. So consider readability and emotional impact. The meta description we've talked about, this is basically just the things that you're again able to override or custom code on the back end of each page that show that 
simple little sentence or two uh, that almost reads like advertising copy for that exact page. It's just that added juice that gets people to click on it. It doesn't really highly correlate to ranking factors, but it's important for promoting user clicks. So this is where I'm gonna dive in a little deeper and see if that page is as relevant to me as that other one that was titled similarly right below it. So we can write that in a way that makes sense to us, but we wanna make sure it's not cut off. We wanna make sure it's yeah legible and you know compelling, etc. So this is where a lot of us get lazy. We copy paste the meta description of every page onto each page. And from the main head site, that meta description for our, that site wide just gets copied onto every individual page. And you should mix it up here if you can. So um, using the first 10 words, using those most important keywords if we can, but again, make sure it makes sense. Keep it conversational, 155 characters max. Just test it out, test it on mobile, test it on desktop, see if it's getting cut off, see if those pages are actually showing up at all. Um, let's give them a reason to click. So an example, learn about this mild flavored cheese, light, versatile, and good for you, plus four fab recipes. Very intriguing, tight and bright. Um, the, the thought in the searcher's head is, oh my gosh, I can learn something from this site and I can get four great recipes. Like I've got to click on that right now. Love it. Discover goat cheese is the name of their page title. They could have maybe capitalized goat and cheese, but maybe that's not their MO as a media outlet. They have their own CP style. Okay, next up, number three in the HTML programming language is the header tags that we've talked about. If you remember way back in module one, we talked about browsio.net. And if you go to that site and you type in your URL of your website, you're gonna see what the search engine sees. And they're gonna show you the page titles, site title, and then the meta descriptions. And then they're gonna show you all your H1s, 2s, 3s on each individual page that you put in there to test. And so this is where these things are, where it's proving to us that it matters. Most of us think as headers and the style of our headers as just an aesthetic thing, but that is falling short. It is so much more than form, it is about function. And if we're mixing them up over time and our H1 suddenly got turned into the 12 point font and the H3 is now the title font at 36 points bold, well, we've just confused Google because it's crawling for H1s. It is literally looking for those coded headers as the most important thing to tell what that page is about. So don't bury your H1s or change them up. Keep an eye on those in your site style sheet. Um, and what we want to do is take people directly to our page content with those. That's the goal. So that when there's headers and subheaders appearing throughout your page or your blog post and they're bolded and they're a little bigger, that's going to appear in that shortcut SERP, which is awesome. It can result in a featured snippet like this one. So that when you do a search and you see a little bit more of a search result, that's because Google has seen that that page is well trafficked and that person has optimized that page well and they're gonna do you that favor and pull in more information from that beautiful page. So again, a heading example, here are my top 11 picks for Calgary and area bike rides, that might be an H1 and then those bullet points could be H2s or H3s again. The title of that page is 11 of the best places to cycle within 75 minutes of Calgary and then uh, the URL is not so bad either. So interesting how Google's gonna mix it up, but man, is that ever compelling copy that goes beyond the meta description. And then they've pulled in that image from that page as well. So a few guidelines, each heading should contain your important keywords. If not, it's a wasted heading. These header tags help Google to create a hierarchy. So the hierarchy of importance that we can't overlook and, uh, and just help our creators break up content as well. So as I'm writing that page, it sure is a lot easier if I have headers, subheaders, and as a reader, it sure is easier to get through. So aesthetically it's important. And again, uh, functionally as well. Image tags, number four, here we go. We're almost there. So this is where, when as a user, I'm a little bit lazy and I'm just going straight to the image results when I search something. I need to look and feel what these, you know, beer koozies look like in my research journey or these ovens. And uh, I'm gonna go straight to that tab in the top of the search browser and I'm going to just see for myself. So rather than loading up images to our website, pages, blogs, and elsewhere that just have JPEG 4935 on them, 
We're going to rename them first. It's just a no brainer. We're going to resize them so they're not too big and the page load speed isn't jammed up with a three megabyte size image of an oven. We're going to really optimize them. 72 DPI, maximum five, 500 kilobytes per image, you know, whatever size and dimensions you need, probably a thumbnail size image. Maybe it's a bigger image and you need to give it a little bit more, you know, size and weight. But for most of the images on our website, they should be web ready. And if you need more information on that, do some homework. Do not load up gigantic images to your site. There is nothing that will slow it down quite so fast as oversized um, ill uh, formatted imagery. But we want to also name it. So this is image tagging and uh, we can do it in a number of different ways, but um, we want to ensure that similar to our page titles, it includes different uh, descriptions. So a properly formatted file name, this is a, a, an example of a WordPress image where you've got a few more options than you might on say Squarespace or Shopify. But with WordPress, I can title that image. I can caption it if I want to, but uh, that's up to you if you decide to have a, a caption and then you want to have your alt text. So if your site was to load in HTML version where you can't actually see the imagery, you can only read the page, that alt text would describe what that image is. And you want to be using those keywords. You want to make sure that the information isn't lost. You still want to be using your business name in there too, if you can. And then likewise, if someone ever saved that image to their desktop or it showed up in search and they, you know, saw what it was titled that they would be able to understand and know that it's yours. And, um, and again, search engines can of course see that as well. So when we look at the WordPress dashboard, um, if this is what you are building your site in, you're going to have all sorts of opportunities for SEO customization. And Yoast is my favorite WordPress plugin. It is um, a tool that is universally used when it comes to WordPress sites, which is uh, what most of the sites on the internet are built on. It's not my favorite. WordPress takes a lot of babysitting and um, kind of know-how uh, and security updates, et cetera, because you've got themes and plugins and WordPress software and they all have to uh, align. But if you were to implement Yoast or a similar type SEO plugin, you're going to get red lights, green lights, yellow lights, suggestions, the ability again to really kind of optimize each page with the page title and description. Um, again, you saw what we can do with the images and alt tags and then just overall re readability. It's going to score your sentence structure and length. How readable is this for the average Joe? And how can we make it so that it's broken up a little bit or that more header tags are implemented or whatever it is. It's going to give you lots of great suggestions and hold your hand into SEO optimization page by page. Squarespace, Shopify, Wix are other kind of content management system websites. So those are the ones that are um, built by a company. They're not open source. Anyone on the internet can build plugins for WordPress. Squarespace is owned by Squarespace. Everything is done in house. You pick a theme, you build your site. It's more secure, um, maybe not quite as infinitely customizable, but it still gives you some great SEO opportunities here. So I'm on the, the homepage of the bluejobs.com and I can, you know, name the page, uh, each individual page. I can adjust the meta description of that page and I'm really smart to do so page by page, not just site wide. Shopify, similarly, you see what um, you've got as just the, the basic built-in SEO functionality of Shopify, which is awesome. And um, I can, of course, adjust it um, page by page and then uh, on the site as a whole. And again, this goes back to kind of keyword mapping. So when I'm thinking about, holy smokes, I've got a 10-page website. I need to optimize each page title and each page description and then anything else I can on that page, like some image tags and some eight headers and copy, it's really great to build a little map. And that could be just the simplest spreadsheet that shows kind of exactly what we're talking about. So I'd encourage you to create something if this is important to you or if you're outsourcing it to get information and to double check that it's read, readable, legible, improving all the time, uh, people are aware of it. Um, and that simply is these types of columns. Uh, page identification. So what is the page title? What is the URL or the individual page extension there? The keywords that are relevant to this page that we've researched and we know to be the 10 most important keywords. Um, and maybe revisit that every quarter because it will change. The current page title, maybe a recommended or changing page title. 
what are some of the existing H1 or, or the only H1 tags? Um, and then you can go down the page with your H2s, etc. And uh, of course, meta description. Just a suggestion, it doesn't have to take much, but if you build it here in one place, it's also really nice to copy paste it into the um, meta descriptions page by page without having to write them on the spot. And you can ensure that they're all different and you can reference it easily, etc. All right, we are rounding the home stretch for real. We have one more module to go. and We're gonna look at the Google formula that ties this all together and really hits home our simplified SEO strategy. I will see you over in module four.